Hi, I'm Pastor Joel Webbin with Right Response Ministries, and this is our show called Questions. Today's question is, do politics belong in the pulpit? Our question is, do politics belong in the pulpit? Now, the statement I'm about to make did not originate with me. I don't know exactly who was the first person who said it, but there are many pastors that I appreciate and respect who have said it. The statement is this, Jesus is Lord is the most political statement in the universe. Jesus is Lord is the most political statement in the universe. And that saying, whoever first came up with it, that saying is fantastic and absolutely true. There's a reason why King Herod wanted Jesus dead. You remember when Herod, kind of like Pharaoh in the days of Moses, Herod was going and, and trying to kill all of, of the, the boys who were two years and younger, right? And he was doing this in Bethlehem. Why? Well, it's because the Magi who were following the star to visit the newborn Jesus told Herod about that. And they told Herod that this Jesus, who they were going to worship and to give gifts to, was not merely the Messiah, not merely a savior, not even just a prophet, but that this Jesus of Nazareth, born in Bethlehem, was a king. He was a king. And he was coming to usher in a kingdom. And he would rule that kingdom with an iron scepter. That's why Herod wanted Jesus dead. See, there are a lot of people today, even in America, I think of, you know, our political government, that they're not threatened or concerned or bothered in the slightest with many different aspects of religion. They don't really care about a religion that, that esteems and, and holds up, you know, so-and-so as a prophet or so-and-so as a Messiah or a Savior. But it's when, it's when the followers of a religion begin to speak of their commander-in-chief as king as Lord, that all of a sudden there's a problem. See, for us, we don't just believe that Jesus is the Savior, the Lamb. See, we believe that He is the King, the Lion, who rules and reigns, and He has certain commandments for His kingdom that must be obeyed, and that we cannot bow our knee we cannot ultimately um, give our allegiance to any other king. No king but Christ. It's not Caesar is Lord, but Christ is Lord. In Rome, uh, Demetrius was putting to death uh, Christians by the thousands because Christians were the ones who would not bow the knee to his statues that he had carved and, and delivered all over the Roman Empire because their allegiance to Christ forbid it. it. would not allow them to bow the knee to any other king. So should politics be in the pulpit? Well, I don't see any way around it. I, I think that if we're going to preach the Bible... And if the Bible speaks to the whole person and the Bible speaks to, to life and godliness, life, human life, all of life, how, how to be godly as a father, how to be godly as a mother, as a son, as a daughter, but also how to be godly, how to be righteous as a worker in, in your vocation, how to be godly as a citizen in a civil state, how to be godly as a pastor, how to be godly in the church, in the state, in the marketplace, and in the home, in all these different spheres of human society. I believe that the Bible speaks to all of that. And I believe that we're called as pastors in the pulpit to give to people the whole counsel of God. And I see, I think that's the problem right there. 
I think a lot of people in the name of gospel centrality, what they really mean is gospel myopticism. They mean gospel exclusivity, not centrality, exclusivity. They mean only preach the gospel. Only. But that's not the call of a pastor. A pastor must preach the gospel, and the gospel should be the central message of his preaching, but it is not the exclusive message. See, a pastor has been charged by God to give to the people of God, not just the gospel, but the whole counsel of God. The whole counsel of God. Meaning that a pastor should be preaching through books of the Bible and being faithful to everything that the Word of God says. And the reality is that the whole counsel of God speaks to the whole man. I'll say that again. The whole counsel of God speaks to the whole man. What I mean is every aspect of his life. And, and good preaching, you may have heard me say this before, but good preaching is composed of three parts. Revelation, interpretation, application. Revelation, meaning a pastor doesn't stand before his congregation on the Lord's day and say, I have a dream, or I have a strategy, or I have an idea, or I have something on my heart. No, revelation belongs to God. It's God's revelation, the infallible, immutable, perfect revelation. So when a pastor stands before his congregation, the revelation is the Bible. So he doesn't say, I have a dream or I have an idea, or a vision, he says, I have a text, a text of God's Word. So three parts in good preaching, revelation, interpretation, application. Revelation, he preaches a text, expositional preaching. Interpretation, the second part is there's a faithful biblical exegesis of that text, the, re the revelation. Now that's where I think a lot of guys, even in the Reformed tribe, stop short. See, so they, they say they, they're expositional, expository preachers. They go through books of the Bible. They always have a text and they give a faithful exegesis of the text, but then they sit down. And I would say at that point, all they've provided is not actually a sermon, but an audible commentary. That's all it is. It's an audible commentary. Here's a text. Here's the exegesis. But see, the last key component of good preaching is revelation. I have a text. Interpretation, here's a faithful exegesis of the text, and then application, where the minister who is representing Christ as he is preaching to the people of God in the church on the Lord's day, he says to God's people, this is what you must do. A good preacher tells people what to do. No, Joel, that's legalism. That's not gospel-centered, and that's, that's so arrogant. What do you mean, tells them what to do? Shouldn't we always say we? You know, Spurgeon is really interesting on the we factor. I call it the we factor. Everybody wants we preaching, right? And I do it um, because it is technically true. The preacher is a sinner. But here's the thing. Um, when I stand in the pulpit on the Lord's Day to preach God's word to God's people, I'm not supposed to stand before them as Joel Webb. Because on the Lord's Day, when they come to hear the word of God, the living word, they're not coming to meet with Joel. They're coming to meet with Christ. Am I Christ in the literals? No, of course not. That would be blasphemy. But the minister is standing in as representative of Christ. The Puritans held to this. The Reformers held to this. The Bible holds to this. This is the traditional model throughout church history is that the minister stands in as a representative of Christ. So when he preaches, he doesn't say we, he says you. Spurgeon was insistent upon this. You say you, preachers. He, he had a school where he would train preachers and he told them to say you when they were preaching to the people of God rather than saying we. In the technical, literal sense, are preachers included in everything that they're preaching? Right? If they're preaching to the people about sin, are they not included as sinners? Yes. If they're preaching to the people of God about grace, about the grace of God, are they not Included as those who are in need of God's grace? Yes, but, but it's not about me on the Lord's day. People aren't coming to sit down and, and, and be shared with from Joel Webbin. Just share with me. Don't preach it. Just share with me. No, a, a real Christian, a devout Christian, a man or a woman who fears the Lord is coming to church on the Lord's day to meet with Christ. And they want their pastor to represent Christ. 
And they're not coming to sit down and have a dialogue where their pastor shares with them in we terms and we language. No, they want their pastor to crawl up into that pulpit, the bigger the pulpit, the better, and to preach you and to stand in as representative of Christ and to offer to them from, straight from heaven, from Christ himself, the bread of life that they might eat and live. So good preaching, faithful preaching, it is Revelation, a text, interpretation, a faithful exegesis, but then also you have not yet really preached until you have application. And in application, the minister tells the people of God what to do. This is not legalism. Legalism is saying, this is what you must do in order to merit the favor of God, in order to be saved. No. We say, this is what you must do in obedience to God, out of love and gratitude for the free salvation you've already received by grace alone, through faith alone in Christ. See, that's not legalism. We're saying you must obey in love because Jesus said, those who love me obey me. So you must obey because you must love God. And I know that you love God because you've seen his love for you. See, anyone who has been awakened to the love of God, that's 1 John 4, 19. We love because he first loved us. If you have seen the love of God for you in Christ, then you cannot help but love him back. You've been given a new heart. You've been made a new creation. You've come alive in Christ Jesus, and you have been endowed with affection and love for God as a response. And because you have love, the sign and evidence and proof of that love for God, according to Jesus, is that you will obey his commands. And so when a pastor preaches to the people of God, and that is who church is for, by the way. Church is first and foremost, it's for God himself to bless the Lord. Secondly, it's for God's people. And in a tertiary, a third kind of sense, it's for unbelievers. Maybe that's part of the problem right there is pastors are just focused on preaching to non-Christians. Now, preaching should be focused on Christians, the people of God. Pastors are, are providing for the people of God the nourishment that they need. We're preaching to sheep, not goats. We always pray that goats might be present, that they might hear the word of God, but we're ultimately praying or preaching rather to sheep, to the people of God. God. And so if I'm preaching to God's people, then they've already been made alive. They love God. And they long, they long and desire to obey him. And all I'm doing is I'm saying, here's his word. Here's what his word means. There's your interpretation, exegesis. And here's how you live it out. This is what you need to do in light of his word, not to merit his favor, but as a response of gratitude and love for the free favor you've received by grace through faith in Christ alone. You need to do something. That's not legalism. That's just good preaching. That's just good preaching. Now, here's the deal. When you tell people what to do, when you have application in the pulpit, when you are actually fulfilling, or at least trying to fulfill, the great commission that Christ gave to us, which is not just to win converts and, and rack up you know, baptisms and like notches on a belt, but to disciple the nations and baptize them into the name of the triune God. And the last part, which we always leave off, to teach them to obey all of Christ's commands. All of his commands. Showing them how to apply the principles of scripture through obedience in every realm of human life. The whole counsel of God to be lived out in tangible, practical, visible ways in the whole man. When you do that, guess what's involved? Guess what that includes? Guess what that affects? Politics. It does. Because here's the deal. Preaching to the people of God, it cannot be like Mufasa standing on Pride Rock with his son Simba. <laughs> and I think it is. I think you're going to like this illustration. I think it is for a lot of pastors. They take their congregation like Mufasa took Simba out on Pride Rock in the, in the morning and, and they let him see the whole kingdom, like the light, the sun and where it shines. And, and this, this sun is like the word of God. And look at how far it stretches it shines on everything. 
The word of God has something to say about everything. And then Simba, the congregation, says to Mephasa, the pastor, what about that dark shadow we place over there? That's the civil state. That's politics, Simba. You must never go there. <laughs> That's how we act. No, is Jesus Lord or not? The most political, bring it all the way back to the beginning of the episode, the most political statement ever made in the universe is this, Christ is Lord. And is there any, any boundary to his lordship? See, the problem is this. We, we did it. Christians, we surrendered. And now the world doesn't want us to take the ground back. We surrendered the moment we started saying, Jesus is the Lord of my heart. That's cute and precious. It's fluffy and sweet. But no, mm -mm. Yeah, Jesus is the Lord of your heart, but that is where his lordship barely begins. That's where it's just getting started. The extent of his lordship extends over everything. And Jesus is not satisfied to be the quiet, gentle, private Lord of his people's hearts alone. He wants his lordship to come out of your heart, through your limbs, out of your fingertips and toes and your mouth and your tongue and to cover the earth so that the knowledge of God would cover the whole earth as the waters cover the seas, that his kingdom, of his kingdom, of his government, there will be no end. There is not one area of human society and life, not one arena that is outside of Christ's lordship and that is outside of the confines of the whole counsel of God. The Bible speaks to all of life. Jesus' commandments must be applied to all of life because Jesus is Lord over all of life. And if pastors cannot help and teach and train and expose that major principle, the Lordship of Christ over everything, in the area of the civil state with their parishioners on the Lord's day, my question would be, why? Why not? See, people don't think politics belongs in the pulpit because they think Jesus doesn't care about politics. They think Jesus doesn't care about politics. But here's the deal. To say that Jesus doesn't care about politics, really what you're saying is that Jesus doesn't care about governments. He doesn't care about this world. He doesn't care about, let's say it like this. He doesn't care about politics because he doesn't care about nations. What, what is politics? Other than talking about the civil governments of nations. Now, Jesus deeply cares about politics because he's a king. And he has a government of which there will be no end. And he has been given the nations as his inheritance to rule over through the agency of his church. Yeah, it, politics, politics are on the table. Politics, you betcha, belong in the pulpit. It's not the only thing a pastor should talk about, but it should be talked about. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching this video. We hope you enjoyed it. If you did enjoy it, uh, we hope that you'll take a moment and subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can watch more content like this. Also, take a moment and give this video a like so that it can reach more people. And take a moment and click on the bell so that you'll be notified whenever we come out with new content. Thanks so much. God bless.